Welcome, everyone. Um, it, this is uh, the Agri Fossi 2030 webinar on influencing policy and what happens beyond uh, the policy brief. So the question, the big question of this webinar uh, today is we've written the policy brief as we discussed in the last one. Uh, if you were if you were a participant in that one, we've written the policy brief. Uh, what happens now? Is our job over as uh, researchers and scientists or can we do more and can we do additional ancillary things to um, to improve the impact of our uh, of our policy messages? So uh, in other words, is the policy brief a means to an end or is there uh, is it a tool to influence policy uh, among other tools or among other processes that we can do? Uh, apply as researchers. Uh, just a rough program for today. We'll have a short introduction by um, uh, by Ivar. Ivar will introduce himself in a second. Uh, he's also with um, SEI and uh, um, very much in charge of the AgriFossi uh, project here at uh, SEI. Um, he'll introduce us to the whole program uh, and after that I'll introduce you to the lady sitting next to me, Isabel Banyeron, who is a researcher with CIRA, which is a different organization. And the idea of today was to give you a bit of a, a feeling for how different organizations try and influence um, policy as well. So that's why we have our special guest here to, today. Uh, with me also uh, is, and you can't see her in the in the picture because she's just sitting outside of the frame, is uh, is Meta Zinong, who is also with the SCI Asia Center, uh, same as me, um, and in the policy group. And uh, she might chime in with uh, discussion points, but she'll also be reading your chat messages. So if you have a question or a comment, please put it in a chat. May will read the chat messages so we can respond to that uh, as needed. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand it over to Ivar, who is in Sweden, so thousands of miles away, but hopefully the technology won't fail us, and uh, Ivar will give his introduction. All right, thanks. switch thanks. over. Yes, yeah, thanks, Clemens, and hopefully you will all see uh, the first slide on my slide uh, presentation. And um, my name is Ivar Virgin, and I work at Stockholm Environment Institute, SAI in Stockholm. Uh, so a bit far off from 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 Bangkok, but uh, as Clemens said, hopefully you will hear and see my presentation. So I'll give you a big a bit of an overview of what the Agri C for 2030 program is trying to do. We're right there trying to bridge science with policy and practice, and the program is is let's see if I can as uh, uh, there we are ah uh, uh, there. It's targeted in SDG 2 of the Sustainable Development Goals um, and high achieving food security and improve nutrition and promote sustainable agriculture. That's the main target of the program. And it's based, it's a CEDA, it's a Swedish International Development Agency supported program and it developed by a number of Swedish universities. Um, and we, and SAI, we are part of the communication and engagement component of the program. And the program is, is based on that. We know that smallholder farmers are accounted for some 70 to uh, 60 to 70 percent of the global agriculture production and are increasingly seen as, as key actors in reaching the SDG 2 at global level. So they're really important, but uh, many of them are facing severe difficulties in, in, and there are many, many challenges, of course, in meeting uh, new demands that are arising and um, trying to sort of uh, cope with new realities and uh, improve their sustainability, their profitability and their productivity. And to a large extent, the transformation agenda is needed to enable all these smallholder farmers to respond to the accelerating demands of, and ensure food security. And we all know that such an agenda and, and all the interventions needed and all the actions and, and, and the policies 
that are to support all this this agenda needs to be science based and knowledge based so to that extent science and scientists do have a crucial role we think and i think you agree with me in supporting smallholder farmers in meeting future food demands and development demands in the years to come so this is the basic premise uh, on what, what the program is, is resting on but but the problem is and you know that as well we have a number of obstacles for, for linking science and policy and practices in sub-saharan africa and, and south and southeast asia where the program is 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 based but we also have we have data which is usually are insufficient uh, and knowledge and accessible or basically lacking meaning that that scientists and science has a has a great role in trying to compile trans uh, synthesize data and knowledge in a form that is useful for policymakers and practitioners. Uh, and we often have inadequate models for linking uh, science to policymakers and, and, and practices. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, yeah. So we have in a, inadequate models for sharing, uh, um, for linking science and policy. Um, and and uh, we also have a problem in scientists often lacking the capacity, capacity to communicate their science and their, their knowledge. I'm back again in, on my screen here. Um, and research um, in, in the AgriForce 2000 uh, uh, target regions and, and basically also research in my country, Sweden, is often primarily academic and generally not designed to address knowledge gaps or specific, specific action points by science scientists, by policymakers or practitioners. And scientists uh, are usually not trained to communicate their, their research outside of academia, academia. So we have a disconnect between science, policymakers, and practitioners. And then we have this program, Agafusi, uh, which is trying to, to, to um, together with scientists, link with scientists in Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia, synthesizing knowledge and, and science in the area of agricultural development, preparing it for communication in the form of policy briefs and, and reports and media um, products, and trying also then to engage and, and with stakeholders, uh, be, be, be it policy makers policy makers or practitioners. Then that's the agri forcey program in a nutshell. So we're trying to analyze and synthesize relevant scientific data. We're trying to communicate uh, these to relevant stakeholders, and we're trying to engage with relevant stakeholders and co-creating knowledge. And it's the latter part that we are dealing with in this seminar now, the engagement part, uh, which is usually, I, I think, for them, it's one of the most crucial parts of this science to link science linking to policy and practitioners. Uh, scheme in a sense that usually we do our research, we do our policy briefs, and then we sort of tick it off, and then we go back to the to the lab or to our to our fields doing our research, and um, and we rarely sort of go beyond that that point. So that we will dig into deeper today. Just to give you a big bit a bit more uh, background on what type of uh, area and focuses the program has. And we have three cost cutting areas, sustainable and intensification of agriculture, uh, agriculture being more productive uh, and more efficient use of human and financial and natural resources. We do have um, an urge to increase women and youth participation in, in agriculture development and try to empower that through the program. And we do think that access to market and value chains for small-scale farmers are key 
to to improve, improve productivity and profitability of small scale farm systems. Uh, and when, then we have also uh, a number of, of um, uh, four themes of the program, and that's um, <clears throat> the uh, social and economic dimensions of small agriculture, multifunctional landscapes, and um, increased productivity of cropping systems, and, and also uh, uh, increased productivity of a small of, of animal livestock systems for small scale farmers. So that's basically the program in a nutshell. Uh, and I hope you've been able to, to hear and see uh, the slides. And I, I hand over now to, to Clemens and colleagues in Bangkok uh, taking this further, the, the, the seminar further. Over to you, Clemens. Okay, thank you, Eva. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, uh, I think we all have to admit this is the first time we're doing, uh, we're applying this technology in the in the team software. We do not have, uh, we do not have com support with us today because that um, that all fell through. So we're struggling with the technology, but hopefully, uh, the, the 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 attendees that are that are online at the moment will still get something out of it. Um, uh, we've uh, we've also uh, prepared a couple of other slides, but I'm not sure actually whether they'll uh, work out. Maybe uh, May can figure it out as as we go along. Um, so thank you very much, Eva, uh, for, for giving us that context. Um, in, in fact, I think it, you know, even though AgriPost is a sort of, sort of um, geared towards um, agriculture, some of the things that we'll talk about might not be just specific on on agriculture but it happens to be the case that um isabel and, and both uh, my research areas are culture um so isabel banyero is a researcher at sirat um but based now in uh, Vientiane, lao pdr lao people's democratic republic and um we have uh, the uh, the, the, we're, we're lucky to have her here in Bangkok at the moment because she has been uh, attending a number of meetings. Just this morning, there was the the workshop on the bioeconomy initiative, and last two days we had the responsible business forum, which uh, which we both attended and I think was quite exciting. But what I want to know is, uh, what what do you do in Laos, and how does a CIRA researcher get to Laos, and and and, and what are the sort of the main issues that you're working on at the moment. Uh, thank you, Clemens. Thanks for inviting me to this exciting uh, adventure. It's my first time sitting and participating. And talking to a computer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so my name is Isabel and I've been working in uh, the Lao PDR for eight years now. Uh, previously, I was um, based in Montpellier, where the headquarters of CIRAT are. We're about maybe 900 researchers. Uh, in Vientiane, we are maybe four. Um, and uh, basically what we do is research in cooperation. Uh, so we cooperate with local institutions in the different countries where we are posted. Mm -hmm. So I started working at the Faculty of Agriculture. Yeah. And then I uh, worked previously in a project at the Ministry of Agriculture and now at the National Agriculture and Forestry Research Institute. Uh, my main, I'm an economist by training, and my main area of interest is sustainability standards. But as there are not so many standards uh, operational in Laos, I work also on regional value chains, which are quite exciting in the area. Yeah. Uh, where producers um, in Laos uh, sell their products to Vietnamese traders or uh, Thai traders or Chinese traders in, in value chains that are mostly regional. Um, so it's uh, I've been doing for the past uh, mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and what I'd like to know, because we're talking about obviously um, policy influence, uh, also creating policy briefs and what to do with that uh, afterward. What's your contact in Laos with policy actors? With uh, how, how do you insert yourself in the policy process in Laos? Okay. Uh, so that that was very new to me, um, and that was really exciting yeah, yeah. in Laos because in 
in Montpellier maybe were more remote in relation to policy makers and more um, focused on doing research. Mm. But in Laos, we are in really close contact with the Ministry of Agriculture mm. and through NAFRI and the faculty um, that are both also really connected to the ministry, we have frequent interaction. Yeah. And that was something that I really learned that we're not only doing research for the sake of research, but um, there is a demand that is not far and we have, and, and it's very rewarding. It's not like you're in a bubble and you're just doing this research and maybe one day you'll publish in a paper. Yeah. Um, it's there, More direct, there's a demand it? and mm. be it, it's not only the, the government sector, it can be an NGO that's interested mm. by having hard evidence or data on a typical subject that they will use in their projects. So the line between the end user and your research is, is much shorter, which makes it uh, really rewarding in terms of research because it's not yeah. abstract. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, mainly we work with ministry people right. or with people who have to uh, give information to the ministry. I don't talk directly to the ministers or people from the ministry, yeah. some of them, but mostly with researchers who are in direct contact with the people from the ministry who really are yeah. waiting for so we're talking about researchers from Laos yes. and who, where would these researchers be working at? Because obviously they're not at CIRAD, right? So, no, uh, uh, they would be working at the National Agriculture and Forestry Research Institute and also at different uh, faculties of the National University of Laos. Right, so that National Agriculture Forestry Research Institute, that's a public research yes. institute. I yes. think that's uh, important to say. Because that's that often a, a, a direct vector into yes. policy, right? Those public research institutes that you have basically, I think, everywhere, right? In, in each country. Yeah? And, uh, and, and they are even under the Ministry of Agriculture. So right. we're even um, more closely connected as many research topics that they work on are really um, in response to a demand from the ministry. Right. So the demand comes on uh, to these researchers yes. and they pass it on to you because you happen to be the expert in let's say regional value chains so they want um, to get your expertise on them. Not always. Mm. Um, the way we work also with the, the NAFRI is that the research demand is passed on to them and then I help them um, with the methodological issues so yeah. I'm kind of in support. They do the research themselves yeah. and there's interaction between us that's the way we because Sihad is also about, it's about research, but uh, yeah. research and cooperation okay. and capacity building and doing research. Okay, so there's a strong capacity building yes. element yes. in all this yes. as well. Yeah, yeah. so we have lots of uh, dialogue and interactions about yeah. how they can best answer the demands that are made to them from the ministry. Right. Um, and, um, and in implementing the research and then after in writing their reports and sharing the information and that's where uh, we start talking about these these policy briefs because yeah that's that was exactly what i wanted to ask you next so CIRAT very similar to sci produces policy briefs as one of their communication outputs yes right um in CIRAT's view uh, or, or, or it, let's say in the in the corporate procedure of CIRAT, what is the purpose of a of a policy brief oh there there, okay, so CIRAD, um, how can we say, we, okay, as many researchers, we're like a herd of cats, so uh, we are quite yeah. independent yeah. in the way we, we communicate our research. Yeah. The mainstream channel is through articles, and then on burning topics, we also have possibility to do those um, policy briefs. Yeah. And, and why I say we are a herd of cats is that, mm -hmm that there is a single format in terms of, you know, colors and outset and everything. Yeah, yeah. But then what the content will be is a bit up to whatever people want to. Up to the context yeah. and so project. Some, and one, yeah. yeah, some people are going to focus a lot on methodology, saying, right. oh, we do games, simulation games, and that, that's the best tool to advocate what we do. And some people are more on to sharing the results, more like a research brief. Yeah. And some are on more burning topics and are you know, just to catch the attention of, of donors. So so we there is a, a single format in terms of presentation right, right. and then in terms of content. It depends upon 
you know, what people, what the message people right. want to share. So, so I'm wondering, in, from the perspective of CIRAD headquarters, what is the audience of a policy brief? Can you say something about that? And then, as opposed to that, what do you think is the audience of a policy brief? Um, okay, so we post them on our website, obviously. Yeah, yeah. But I think that um, mostly we use them not at central level in Montpellier, but mm. maybe in the different countries where we in operate. In the local context. Yes, right. in the local mm. context. And a lot of it is um, maybe not so much to share research with researchers, because we obviously um, do um, scientific papers, but mostly maybe to um, disseminate our research with donors. Um, and um, also with potential partners, because there's yeah. a big partnership component. So this is what we could do, not alone, but together with others. Mm -hmm. um, but it would be, I would say, mostly donor against. Yeah, so re other researchers, donors, potential partners. Yeah. What about policy actors? Well, <laughs> that was um, actually, okay, maybe I'm very not representative in this aspect, but um, until I came to Laos, I was not very much policy oriented. I was, you know, doing the research. Just academic. Yeah, academic. Yeah. And it's really being in contact. That's really what I learned from the Lao context. Yeah. And I'm really grateful because that's really interesting. Yeah. That that's what I really learned when working with researchers in Laos. And I say, let's do this great paper, and they don't yeah. really care what for. Yeah. And what they no want. Impact, right? Yeah. No yeah. impact. And they. It's difficult, it takes so much time, mm. and they don't even know who's going to read it, and it's not useful for them. But at the same time, they have very important demands. They're really demand-driven towards the ministry, towards donors, towards roundtable processes in the country. And so that's when we started realizing, maybe two, three years ago, that we really had to change the way we communicate our research to right. make it more user friendly and, and make it useful for the main people with whom we work and yeah. for whom they work and to be really part of the policy process. So that was yeah. um, that was a major discovery for me. Yeah. Um, and I think that was really um, useful. That's great. Yeah. I to go back a little bit and ask you, OK, so you come from Montpellier, you're plunked into this ecosystem, as you described it in Laos, where you're not just uh, in your academic ivory tower, but you <laughs> actually have to interact with policy people, with other researchers, with NGOs, with uh, donors. And and I imagine because Laos is a relatively small place, you all know them personally as well. And when you go on, <laughs> when you go for dinners, you might see them on the other table. And so, so it's a very close, uh, yeah, very, it's very close, isn't it? Yeah. So, so obviously, as you say, writing uh, articles in agricultural economics journals uh, might not have an immediate effect on on uh, the political or policy ecosystem there. Um, but nevertheless, you still produce, I assume, uh, a policy brief. So who are those people who, uh, now in the Lao context, who are those people who take them, read them, and policy maybe briefs. act upon them? Um, those would be mainly um, people working at the ministry level. Yeah. Um, and also donors. Right. And NGOs. People. In, okay. In, in, in Laos. In Laos. Yeah. Yes, maybe in Laos. Yeah. I would say that, okay, um, maybe that brings us to the question of what do you want to do with what you want to achieve with your policy brief. Yeah. And um, I think that. Uh, without being pretentious and think that we're going to be able to change the world. Um, I don't know how much we can do that. But the objective is, is to bring change right. in the way things are done and um, to back that with evidence about what's not working currently and yeah. how things could change. It's not also, it's maybe not about giving the best solutions, but bringing people to think about the solutions that we propose but are among a set of options yeah so um yeah so you don't have all the answers but you no. want to give possible um, scenarios of exactly. if they options. do something yeah. then yeah. that might happen or, and and, yeah. and maybe attract because in laos there's so many issues that are being discussed yeah and so maybe bring to the fore what we think are 
priority issues or issues that we think uh, should be taken into account? Well, okay, so that would be the way we would do as foreign researchers. Mm. But in Laos, also there is this demand driven. So mm -hmm. most of the time, the topics are also given to us. Mm. What do you think about developing the tea sector? Yeah. Or so we have uh, both topics that can be uh, developed this way. And then the idea is is to share this information we have and and bring people around the table because maybe that's what that's what's interesting with the policy brief. The objective is not only to show how good and how clever and how interesting our research is, but to bring people together to discuss the policy brief. And I think that's the next step that, yeah. that really we want to um, yeah. achieve. Yeah, okay. Um, let me just interrupt you here. May, if there are any questions in the chat room, then um, then let us know, okay? We, uh, you can you can interrupt us anytime. Thanks. Um, and what I, what I wanted to get onto um, is something that you said before, which is uh, you're learning how to communicate research differently. So obviously not the traditional academic yes. route. Um, there, there is research that's actually demanded from you within your uh, within your context. How can we, let's say you're doing your research on regional value chains, how do you, can you insert your knowledge into ongoing policy processes? I mean, <laughs> the, 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 I, what I'm getting at is, is it enough to write a research brief or a summary of your research or a policy brief and then send it by, by email to the oh, yeah, deputy, yeah, yeah. Debu uh, sorry, director general of planning or is there an additional sort of effort needed to really get those oh, yeah, messages yeah. across? There is. Yeah. Oh yeah, there is. I think uh, the whole idea of, of trying to uh, foster policy dialogues or yeah. try to have places, I don't know how you call it, where you can really exchange about the policy brief, the policy brief being a starting point where you can engage people. Uh, what do you think about this? First for fact checking, you know, is, yeah. this, is this also important to you and is what we're talking about or writing or diagnosis, is it, mm -hmm. it, do you think it's a good one? Do so you basically you're validating your own research, okay. aren't you? Yes, yes, yeah, that's yeah. revalidating, just yeah. making sure. And then once we're all on board with the same or, or maybe uh, different views, but that we agree on, on, on the, the landscape of, of that problem, uh, try to discuss with people the solutions or the options, um, their pros and cons, and how to move for, further from there. And I think that's maybe that's the most important part of the policy brief. It's not only about advertising what we're doing, but also to launch yeah. some kind of discussion with people. So that's when it's important to really know well the landscape, that you don't yeah. get only one type of person, like, okay, maybe policymakers, but also maybe NGOs, uh, farmers, if it's possible, if they're important in the, in, in the issue. Uh, maybe private sector people, so that you have a balanced view of, of, of the issue that you're talking about, mm -hmm. which makes it richer because you don't represent only uh, the interest or the viewpoint of research or of policy makers yeah. or government or NGOs or that you have, because that's what you want to achieve. Mm -hmm. So, so basically, the policy brief is a, the start of a dialogue. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what I'd be interested in is, okay, we're starting a dialogue now. We've written our policy brief for start a dialogue. Um, how does this dialogue take place? Like, is this, how can we imagine a policy dialogue to take place? Is this like a big formal event where, where we give um, tons of PowerPoint presentations <laughs> and everybody's bored to death or falls asleep or plays with their phone? Or is this something on a much smaller scale where we try to interact with various policy actors and try and have discussions with them and influence them thereby? In, in your case, what are the various sort of venues of, of a policy dialogue? Uh, I guess there could be, to be imaginative and creative. You can have uh, maybe a big forum. Maybe you could keep the big forum for the final part when you restitute mm -hmm. the interactions you can have. You could imagine uh, stakeholder meetings with different kinds of stakeholders to validate 
uh, from different perspectives. Yeah. Um, I was just thinking earlier about um, uh, maybe we have had instances where we organize games, you know, when, mm -hmm. when we have through the policy brief we <coughs> identified scenarios um, mm. to cope with different problems and these scenarios can be played in participatory games and then we could feed the results in these games and have something different formats are possible I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. okay and I, I'm also wondering uh, whether the dialogue also takes place in the form of like informal like using your network and um, having informal conversations with policy actors to sort of yeah. plant plant seeds of ideas in their minds, something like that. Yeah, yeah, that can happen also. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, as thing is that yeah, as many avenues <laughs> as as possible. It's really what is interesting with the policy brief is that it's something that you could just carry around and share with many different kinds of people because mm -hmm. it's supposed to be very simple, um, yeah. addressed to a broad uh, audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it's something that you could carry mm -hmm. around and it could be the basis mm -hmm. of discussion for many different types of stakeholders. Yeah. So. We're talking about simple, simple messages. Yes. Um, I mean, I guess in your research, uh, uh, you know, there's a wealth of data that comes up and it's all complex and, 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 and there's so much interesting information that you come up with. How do you select those those key messages? You know, often in the policy brief you have like three or four, these are the key messages, you know, policy right. should change that or whatever. Um, how, how do you select those messages? You know, is it according to the government demand, whatever they they want or, or yeah, how? how yeah. Um, How do you prioritize? Yeah, I guess that's um, that's when it gets a bit complicated because at one, okay, I'm I'm thinking about one type of research that we've been doing sure. with uh, um, with Oxfam on consumers, and then we think about who this research and the results could be. Uh, useful for and, and how it could be used uh, for the final objective that would be, for example, access of all to organic farming. And then you can think about, okay, who can use it? Who would be the end users and how they could use it in the end? Yeah. But um, it, I think it's a, it's, it's a complicated issue for researchers to stay simple, be simple. Yeah. In, in Sirad, we participate each year to this big agri fair in France. Mm -hmm. And so each year we have a booth with lots of display. Mm -hmm. And people who go there are ordinary French citizens. Right. And they go to this huge fair where they can see big animals and tractors. And, and they they stop at the Sirad. So hang on, they booth. see big animals and tractors and then they see the Sirad booth. Right. Okay. And they ask you where you're selling. Yeah. What, what, what are you doing? And so you, we say, you know, and, French we say research for the south and uh -huh. they go south of France. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? What, what? So I think it's it's uh, well, every day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, are you working in Nice or yeah. Marseille? Okay. And I think it's um, I think this is a very good exercise that we had because first we had to help, you know, make the booth with all the posters. And and we have a tendency to use jargon. And we had people yeah. talk to us constantly. As we yeah, and say, oh, what are you talking about? And what really are you doing? And I think for us, it was a fantastic exercise to um, to take this, um, yeah, take the habit of explaining simply. And that's mm -hmm. always mm -hmm. what I tell students and young researchers with who I, I work. Just pretend I'm your grandma and explain what you're doing. And mm -hmm. it's not because you're explaining it simply that it's stupid, but I think this, this is, um, a duty that researchers have to yeah. be able to express in a simple way for many people to catch on yeah. what they're doing. And it's not necessarily dumbing it down, no, but no, it's using course. the right language. Isn't exactly, it? so yeah. that people understand yeah. that you're not working in these, but that yeah. you're tackling problems that many times they're not aware of because, you know, ordinary 
citizens don't care about nutrition sensitive value chains, for example. Yeah. They don't even know what it is. Or exactly. Do it. Who would? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. And so, and and you just wonder why you're doing all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. So, and, and another thing that we discussed yesterday, actually May brought it up, is, um, and that might be culturally very specific, but the tone of the policy brief. So not just yes. what the message is, but how do you uh, convey the message? And, and you know, how do you strike the balance between, oh, I'm this serious scientist that invested a year of my time in coming up with this genius solution, mm -hmm. and also, on the on, on the other hand, you you have to present your work as an offering rather than rather than sort of a paternalistic type of, yes, of yes. you know you got to do this now because because I sacrificed my time. You know? <laughs> and I guess you know a, 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 the tone might be different in Laos, exactly. in Thailand, in France, or wherever. Yeah, right? yeah. we it's funny because. Um, I put a lot of emphasis on the titles, trying to have you know catchy and appealing titles and subtitles in my policy briefs. And then when we you know try to translate them into Lao, people are horrified because that's not the way. Titles don't work. No, it mm -hmm. doesn't. It doesn't convey the message the same way. Yeah. And so one of the problems we've had is translating the policy brief that we initially, I initially or collectively we initially wrote in English. Mm -hmm. and translating it and having in the end something that's appealing and where there's a message and where people see the importance of your message mm -hmm. in Lao yeah. uh, with the extra difficulty that I don't read Lao. So I'm not So able it's to kind see. of like Google Translate, you're translating <laughs> to Lao and then back into French. No, no, the person who was translating was a person doing research in Lao, so ah, she okay. knew what she was okay. doing. So their research was, like, that was, that that was great. Yeah. But it still is difficult because when, when we did this, this workshop about policy briefs um, with uh, people from the Research Institute and the Ministry, and we looked at these different policy briefs, and there was our policy brief that we shared mm -hmm. in Lao, and at the Ministry, people looked at it and said, it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. And I was a bit crushed because mm -hmm. I thought it made a lot of sense in English. Mm -hmm. and, so I, and so I think there's, it's not only about translating, it's about yeah. Conveying the messages the right way so that the people, nuances, huh? yeah, that people and that people want to read it and trust the message. If it's too, you know, the type of messages that go through in English might not be the same type of messages that go through in uh, in Lao. And also maybe the de the degree of detail. Yeah. People said, "Oh, you're not detailed enough in the recommendations," but yeah. we didn't feel that we were legitimate to make these, you know, very detailed level of, of, of message. Yeah. Of recommendations and that yeah. should be further discussed. So, yeah. what exactly are people waiting from the policy brief, yeah. and and how receptive are they to the way you write the messages? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess is, okay. Cool. Um, uh, and over to May, who has a question. So we have a question from Elizabeth, who is from Kenya, and she going back to your earlier point about speaking to farmers and um, an audience that's easier to not policy makers. Sure. Um, she says she's, she wants to know if farmers are engaged through the policy brief at all, if any, and uh, how farmers issues might be presented to po policy makers. Okay. Well, like the, the perspective of the farmer to presented the, to policy presented makers. Presented to the policy makers. Okay, okay. Thanks Elizabeth for the question. Um, you want to respond? In that policy, in the, the latest policy brief we were I'm talking about in the consumers. It, okay, they were um, they were not directly engaged. It was really maybe because it was about consumption, so it was more the downstream part. But mm -hmm. there was something on farmers, but they were not directly um, uh, in the process. I think that okay. So now we're in, for example, we're in a project where we're really working closely with the farmers, and I don't think the policy brief would be. Uh, the tool that I would use. We would yeah, we would probably exactly, yeah. take the results from what we're doing and then we're trying what we're doing is we're going to do some games with them. Yeah. With them, but also with traders because it's it's a multi stakeholder. Yeah, a lot of value chain. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And where what issues we think are the important issues for you know, this is about diversifying out of maze. So we're the issues that we spot as the relevant issues. We try to make them pop out of the game, right. 
but so that you know farmers and other stakeholders discuss directly. I don't think there's a need for a policy brief in this case. Yeah. I guess yeah, yeah different yeah. So different types of, of different tools are going to be able available yeah. uh, for different audiences. It's, yeah. it's a big uh, question, the question of audience. Yeah, I think that's a really good point because there's this thing that we call policy brief. Now, do we produce this for policy actors specifically, or are we trying to cast a much wider net, as you said before, to encompass donors, other NGOs, research partners, the, academy, uh, the, the academia, uh, and perhaps farmers, or, uh, or, or do we segment the market, so to speak, yeah. and say we're producing policy briefs so that policy actors can take up some of the messages that we're trying to convey to them, and perhaps uh, to communicate with farmers, we need farmer briefs or yeah. we need games, or we need short video clips, or whatever the case may be. I don't know what the farmers in Kenya uh, yeah. like to, what for? kind of media <laughs> they're, they're, they consume, or maybe like little Facebook videos or whatever. Yeah. Um, in Myanmar, for example, may you know that, um, there is a farmer TV channel uh, where research tries to convey uh, messages through that TV channel. I don't think it works 24 hours, but uh, but there are certain times of the day where uh, sort of news from farmers come up and a lot of messages uh, for them. And I think probably the messages to the farmers are different messages yeah. than what we're sending to policy uh, actors. Obviously, the messages to farmers might be more behavior behavioristic. I don't know what the word is exactly. Uh, so how to change their practice, when to use fertilizer, when to apply, uh, what's the right time to apply irrigation, so on. Whereas policy actors might not need to know all this stuff, yeah. but might need, might have to know uh, if they change, if, if, if a thousand farmers change their, uh, their agronomic practice, what kind of a large scale effect would that have on the landscape or on the water quality or whatever. And so, yeah, maybe yeah. thinking of Kenya, but also um, Asia. Um, another type of way to engage with farmers is um, having on-site cross visits. Things that might be more you know, speak yeah. than just handing out leaflets or sharing information that you. So instead of saying, "Oh, this is how you should do it because this is how it's done elsewhere," just try to have. Farmers. When we discuss with farmers in different locations and and about you know recent um, project activities, they're always very happy because they went to this farmer's place and they learned mm -hmm. this and this and they exchanged mm -hmm. on this problem and they were able to relate that oh maybe these farmers in Vietnam they're very far away but they have the same problems as they yeah, do. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. So yeah, and it's actually sometimes good even to take policy. Yes. people along to these yes. kind of businesses yes. so exactly. they see what's happening on the ground. Yeah. 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 May you have another question or comment? Yeah, we have a, a question about monitoring and evaluation, if you'd like to talk about that now. Of, um, basically monitoring the impact of the policy brief on the policy maker. Yeah. So That's how do you ensure that there's feedback into uh, your process of policy engagement, which could be the policy brief, but which could also involve other things. Yeah. It's a great question. Like, how do we actually measure the impact of, of a given policy brief? Uh, personally, I don't have an answer to that. You know, obviously, if it's online, you can measure the number of clicks and, yeah. and so on. But that's not really impact, right? That's just how many people happen to click on your uh, policy brief and probably if you pay Google enough money you, you'll get more clicks so that doesn't result in behavior change and like you said before in the end what we want is is to 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 affect change yes so uh, I personally I'm not sure I don't know do you have an answer to that well I mean the policy change would be one but it takes time and often you don't stay enough time to see those policy changes exactly but maybe um, Going to various meetings in Laos, when you say that some of the words that you've been using and trying to promote are increasingly used, it's not because they're being used that they're going to translate into change yeah. in, in practices, but 
you know, some ideas that you're trying to make uptake are actually taken up by the different stakeholders yes. is, is something interesting. Um, also, maybe one um, engaging with the private sector or NGOs having you know, activities. The thing is that the policy process is so long, you know, it's difficult to see. Right. But when, if you have different bits and pieces of projects or, or, or more short-term activities mm. stemming from what you've been able to, to showcase. Mm. Um, but it's true that it's, it's uh, that being able to see, That's a tough one. yeah, and being yeah. able to see the results of, of these policy views would yeah. be really rewarding, and, but it's, it's something that doesn't really yeah. take some yeah. time to I mean, I think I can give a, an example also from our work in, in, in Laos where we were we were supporting the Ministry of Agriculture on developing a sustainable agriculture policy. And while we were doing that, the government was uh, developing its national green growth strategy. So there was a request from the Prime Minister's office to the Ministry of Agriculture uh, asking them to comment on the, one of the initial drafts of the uh, national green growth strategy document. The, because we happened to be there at the time, the ministry said, well, you guys from SEI, why don't you comment on it first? Obviously, they're offloading some of the extra burden of work that they have, but uh, they happened to uh, be working with us as experts. Uh, gave us the document to read, which, which was, which was um, I think, not, not uh, exactly due process because these were confidential documents at the time. We weren't allowed to get electronic copies. I'm not even sure if I'm supposed to say <laughs> this now. <laughs> uh, uh, so we only had paper copies and so on. Gave our, they gave our comments. They received our comments, did whatever they needed to do uh, with them, and then submitted the comments back on back to the, the, the Prime Minister's office. And I think um, while it is not, while we're not able to prove that we have actually had an influence, I think notionally we did have an influence because some of our comments were taken on and now can be found in the, in the, in the, the National Green Growth Strategy. Maybe I have another example. Yeah. I, I was remotely involved in that, but just to show how ideal the setting is in Laos, there was this big problem with uh, bad banana investors in northern Laos, um, people who were leasing land um, in Laos and, and growing bananas in a very unsustainable way. And so that caught the, the, the ear of the minister who asked the NAFRI to do um, a research on those bananas and what they unveiled was really astonishing. And so they didn't do a policy brief at that time, but mm -hmm. there was this round Anyway, the result was that there was this policy dialogue and they really shared and they really created a buzz, which was what yeah. they wanted to do. Yeah. And that was followed by a ban. A ban of a the ban bananas. A ban of these banana investors. Temporary yeah. ban, but you know, the message went through. There's yeah. a problem, yeah. we have to stop it now. Yeah. And while we're stopping it, we have to think about how to foster responsible agricultural investment in Laos. And then there were further works carried on, not only with bananas, but perennial crops in general to see what are the rules of the game that we want to be set in Laos for investors to come um, yeah. to grow rubber or bananas or whatever? So I think that's yeah. maybe that's a fairy tale of a you know yeah. everything going very smoothly. Yeah. Demand coming to the research, research providing some yeah. answers, recommendations, I don't know, solutions, options that are discussed with the with the policymakers, and then then something happening in. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think we have to work with these kind of impact stories because uh, yes. very often we won't be able to to you know to, to, to show the proof in black and white. Yeah. But uh, but uh, I think sometimes, sometimes we do have influence. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. May there's another question. Yeah, um, this question is on accountability. Given the political reality of uh, working there, yeah. um, how would policy recommendations ensure at least broad responsibility of consumers, producers, local authorities, farmers. Yeah, I think it's something that you already mentioned a little bit and sometimes the, the information that we can, we come up with can be a bit sensitive as well. Yes. Right. Yes. 
and we what we don't want to do is damage the relationship yes. between all those actors that you just mentioned, May, the, the producers and the, the industry, and perhaps on you know antagonizing the, the, the farmers and, and the other way around and so on. You don't want to bring mess, you want yeah. to bring dialogue. Yeah, and what you want to bring is dialogue and then each of these actors also being accountable for their actions and perhaps the, the, the effects that they that they uh, um, produce on other stakeholders whenever they change their course of action. Yeah. I think the objective is not, is, well, okay, when we're working on these issues of, of investments, not blaming and shaming, but trying yeah. to bring evidence to change in a positive way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. One? yeah, one more question about the policies of relying on the policy itself that you're trying to influence. So um, they, we have Sopal from Cambodia who believes that it, the policy itself doesn't sustain change in farmers, farmers or practitioners' yeah. actions. So can you talk a little bit more about yeah. maybe the method of yeah. relying on the policy process only? Yeah, I think Sopan has a very a very uh, a very good point which is that policy often doesn't even impact the behavior yes. the, in the behavior of the individual farm right but um uh, i think nevertheless we shouldn't discard policies and say oh it's just talk all these people uh, uh just talking and actually doesn't relate to 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 the reality of the farmer because i do think that policy can provide a certain environment uh, for farmers to 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 work in or to um, to produce in. Yeah. What, what do you think about that? Um, over the past two days in these different you know, conferences, we've been we've been talking a lot about multi-stakeholder dialogues, yeah. and I think this is something important not to rely, rely only on policies, but also uh, on the different voices of, of the different stakeholders. It could be private sector. Yeah. It could be, uh, it is mostly also the, the farmers, yeah. the NGOs, civil society, and uh, okay, so it's more or less easy to do in, in different areas. Yeah. But for example, when we're going, when we're doing these simulation games that we're going to organize, mm -hmm. it's typically with, you know, by making people play, for example, their own situation that you have traders and farmers engage and, and identifying problems together. So it's the private sector and our staff of the government at the local level, because of course we have this other problem is that the policies are divided, defined at the central level, Vientiane, and then um, well, goes down to the province, goes down to the province, mm -hmm. to the district, to the village, and by, by that time, either the message is diluted or they don't have the means of implementing, or no. and so it's it's. It's not only a top-down thing, and, and I think it's very important to see how these policies um, and, and, and the way they are implemented on the ground makes sense yeah. also. And, and there was this other policy um, brief that um, we did with the tea, and we had this interaction with the different levels, district, province, or province, yeah. district. But I think this is very important to take into account the fact that there might be discrepancies between the, you know, central level and yeah. Uh, decentralized areas where yeah. the policies are actually used. So it's a as a researcher, uh, you, basically you don't have to just focus on the subject matter of your research, but also how to get this policy dialogue going and how to uh, influence this process of, of, of policy dialogue with positive messages about your about your research. And and I think in order to wrap this up here now, um, the policy brief is not, you know, it doesn't stop at the policy brief, right? No. Uh, the policy brief is one tool of many tools yes. that help us to communicate with the people that we want to communicate within a multi-stakeholder dialogue and policy actors are very much a part of that multi-stakeholder yeah. dialogue, but certainly not the only ones that we need to yeah, talk to. And even governments are not the only ones that we need to talk to. Um, but but uh, but um, I think nonetheless we can use policy briefs as a vehicle to, commu to communicate certain messages, to summarize uh, research, 
and to to sort of validate some of the some of the things that we say in these various meetings. But we have this training ourselves on policy briefs because <coughs> we also needed to be trained. Yeah. And the trainer said something I remember is that if you just write a policy brief and then you stop, then you you can just save your time and don't write the policy brief. If you're mm -hmm. just writing it and, and, and doing nothing with it, just mm -hmm. go play golf or yeah. cook, do whatever you want. Yeah. But don't do that because that's just mm -hmm. a waste of time. Yeah. If you do the policy brief, you have to take it all the way and, yeah. and, and take advantage of all, of all the wonderful thing it, it enables to do through the dialogue that you can engage with other people. Okay. Well, I think that wraps this up. Thank you very, very much, Isabel. It was great to have you here Thank at you. our first yes. uh, webinar for all of us uh, uh, as a special guest. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Maid, for being an excellent producer. <laughs> uh, that was really, really great. Thank you, Ivar, for your excellent introduction to Agrifosi. He's waving through the computer. Um, <clears throat> and hopefully everything's still okay with your farm and you're going to change behavior. Uh, and um, thank you to the audience for listening to us and watching us. And I hope it uh, asking questions, asking questions. That was us? that was very good. And I hope you found this a little bit useful. But from us from Bangkok now, thank you very much, and see you next time.